I was thinking a little bit about what God might be saying to us as a church as we kind of leave Easter behind. And I think what he's trying to say through this passage, there's loads in this little passage we've read, but I think what he's saying to us today is that you can be fulfilled. You can have a fulfilled life. And I just wonder, Martin said, I'm kind of new-ish, so I'm still trying to learn everybody's names. I'm afraid I've not quite got there yet. But I just wonder if there's people here today and you feel unfulfilled, you feel a little bit empty, you don't feel as full as you could be. Over maybe as we kind of leave COVID times, well, when we've not really left them, have we? But you know what I mean. You were hunkering down for a couple of years and at the start of 2020, when everything seemed to kind of go wrong, you said to yourself, when this is over, I'm going to dot, 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 fill in the blanks, whatever it is, go on a massive holiday, go out and see all my friends, I'll change my job, I'll move to the countryside, I'll, I'll live by the seaside, I'll have flexibility in my timetable, I can go into the office two days a week and work from some really nice cafe for the rest of the time, whatever it is. But actually now it's got to the end of that period, you, you actually feel a bit empty, a bit unfulfilled. You don't feel like everything's as you wanted it to be. It might have nothing to do with COVID. It could just be you've started a new job and you just don't feel as fulfilled as you could be. Or maybe it's something, in a relationship that you're in that's not as fulfilling as it was. Or maybe you, you really want to be in a, a romantic relationship, but you, until you get there, you feel like you're full, unfulfilled. Well, today, whatever it is, God wants you to know that you can be fulfilled. In fact, to call yourself a Christian, to be a Christian means that you have a filled life. You have a full life. So if you're looking for a clever title for my talk, you could have something like how to be fulfilled or how to have a fulfilled life. And if, if you want three kind of pithy ways to be fulfilled, the first way would be to look back with thanks. Verse 3 says this, we always thank God. I grew up in Cumbria, which is quite a way away from London. And the thing about people from that part of the world is that they're quite straight talking. They don't mince their words. A spade is a spade. It's quite a common kind of phrase that people would use. And I worked in a, a wood yard once, building picnic benches. And often people would come and they'd ask to borrow my drill or my saw or whatever it would be. And the best I could hope for when I would be like, of course, of course, please take my drill, would be, tart. that would be it. That would be it. That's all the thanks that you'd get. When I graduated university, I moved to London. And I moved to East London, and I was part of a family of church plants. And I worked for one guy called Rick. And Rick, I quite liked him. He definitely wasn't northern, but he... He, he didn't mince his words. He would call a spade a spade. So he's quite straight talking. And I quite liked that. But the thing about him that made him different was he was so thankful. He was so thankful for absolutely everything. I've never met anyone so thankful. He'd run these meetings. And if, from what I could see, people were just doing their jobs. But he'd be so thankful for them. Like, well, you, you, it's what you pay them for. But they just, he'd be so thankful I made him a cup of tea once, and I gave it to him. Here's a tea. It took me ages. And he's like, thank you so much for this cup of tea. I was bowled over by his thankfulness. It's not hard to make a cup of tea. But the, but the thing was, when he was so thankful, I felt great. And actually, he looked like he felt great. It was like he had a fulfilled life. He looked fulfilled. If you're looking for something more to fulfill you today, it starts with thankfulness. But we're not just thankful for cups of tea, as good as they might be. We're thankful to a God, a God who has rescued us, who saved you, a God who has forgiven all of your sins. That's who we're thankful to. To get our heads around what's going on in this passage a little bit more, it's probably helpful just to understand the context this book, well, this letter was written to, uh, by the Apostle Paul in prison to the church in Colossae. 
which someone else had planted. And Paul had never met this church. He'd never been anywhere near it, but he'd sent people to plant it. And actually, Paul loved this church by extension. He loved them. And you can see that throughout this letter. And the whole letter is addressing a few things, but one thing in particular. The church in Colossae had become insular. It had become a closed shop. It wasn't growing much. People had become fixated on knowing these deeper things about the faith. And they were completely obsessed with getting to know this deeper knowledge. There was this group of people who were teaching that there was more to the faith than people thought at the beginning. And to get access to that, they had to go deeper and deeper and deeper and then deeper. And the result of this was that the church had closed itself off. It had become a closed shop. So no one could get in, and those inside it were just kind of hunkering down and hunkering down and hunkering down. So the people inside were unfulfilled because they were chasing after this deeper knowledge that they couldn't really ever get. And every time they thought they got somewhere deeper, they were told, no, there's more, there's more. You had to go deeper and deeper. And the people outside who maybe could have done with a relationship with Jesus that was the one thing that the church had to offer this church in the first place. They were unfulfilled because they couldn't get it because the church was so insular, no one could get in. And the problem was people were looking in the wrong direction. Every time people came in, they were trying to break into this inner ring, this inner level of knowledge. And no one was ever going to get it because they weren't looking the wrong way. And this was the they weren't looking the right way. And this was the context that St. Paul, the Apostle Paul, speaks into. And what he's trying to do, he's, he's, trying to, he's trying to open up the church a bit. He's trying to kind of open the doors a bit more. And he starts by looking back with thankfulness. He gives thanks to God for all the great things that God has done in that community, in that church. And he also tells them to remember it. He says, you remember your faith. Verse 7, you learned it from Ephraphus. Don't forget that. He's telling them to remember that once they didn't have a faith and now they do. He's reminding them there's more to their faith than just what's going on in their town, in their little city. Verse 6 and 7, the faith has come to you and it's bearing much fruit around the world. This is like a worldwide thing that they're part of. And so today, for us, this has a, a real-world application. You can think about it like this. C.S. Lewis has a, an essay called The Inner Ring. And the basic premise of the essay is that when you join anything, any organization, any church, any group of friend, friends, when you move town to a new place, if you get a new job, what there is is you start here. And there's a kind of there's a ring to break into. There's a group of people, the in crowd, or there's things you need to know so that people will respect you, so that people will understand you. So what you do is you start here, let's say it's a new job and you, you, you need to get to know the right people so that you can have influence in the organization. Or if it's school, you need to get to know the right crowd so that you can, I don't know what it is you do at school anymore, be cool, whatever it is. So what you do is you learn the codes, you learn the, the right things to say at the right time. You learn the right clothes to wear. You say the right things. Or you learn the deeper knowledge. And you break through into that ring. And this works on two levels. It works socially, but it also works in terms of knowledge. And you break through. And you go, yes, I'm in the in crowd. So exciting. And as soon as you're in there, you start looking around and you think, ah, there's another ring. There's another crowd of people. And if I don't break through, then I'm never going to be in. So you start again. And you think, okay, I've got to learn the new codes, the new social codes to whatever's going on. I need to learn to say the right things again to this group so that they'll think that I'm worthy of this breaking into this inner ring. I need to get to know the right people, the power brokers, those in charge. And so what you do is you break through and you're in the inner ring. But when you get there and the dust settles, you notice there's another ring. There's a cooler than cool crowd. There's another level of knowledge to get to know. And you're back where you started. You're alone. You're on the outside. And you can never, never break in. The more you chase it, the more unfulfilled you are. 
And maybe you can relate to this a little bit. Maybe you feel like you're, you're trying to go deeper, but every time you try and go deeper, you, you can't break, you, you find another level, or you can't just break through that, that inner crowd. Or maybe you feel like there's a group of people who are excluding you, and you feel like you're on the edge. Well, we can start today by giving thanks. Remember that you're part of a church family that's worldwide. Remember you're part of this church. Remember you're part of the church that you're part of. Remember your faith story. Remember that maybe you weren't a Christian, now that you are a Christian. In my house at tea time, we, we do this thing. We've got two little kids. They're quite little. So tea, tea is usually quite early, five o'clock. And if you've ever, most people are awake at five o'clock, I guess. But blood sugar is quite low at five o'clock, especially in my house. So we kind of sit around the table and we, um, we, the food gets served. And we, we have to go around the table and say what we're thankful for. Now, Joss, he's only two. So it's quite hard. He doesn't always understand. But he says something. And we all say something. And we all say what we're thankful for. And that could be something as simple as, thank you, Lord, for the grass. Thank you for the sun today. Thank you for my peas on my plate. Or whatever it is. It could be something really simple. But as the food fills up our bellies, our blood sugar level rises a little bit. And as that happens, the thankfulness fills us up as well. It's, it's like we're being filled with thankfulness. We feel fulfillment in our lives. You might want to try it too. Just start a list of things that you're thankful for and watch how it can quite literally give you fulfillment. And you realize that wherever you are in this, you can, you can be thankful wherever you find yourself in these rings. That's the first way is to give thanks. The second way to find fulfillment is to look up with faith, to look up with faith. Verse 9 says this, for this reason, since the day we heard about you, we've not stopped praying for you. We continually ask God to fill you with all the knowledge of his will through all wisdom and the understanding that the Spirit gives. I used to live in Gateshead, northeast England, and I was training to be a vicar, training to do the job that I do now, um, and and uh, we were helping to plant a church in Gateshead, and I was training down in Durham. So I'd spend a lot of my time cycling to and from Durham and Gateshead in this valley. And our house was built on the side of a big hill, and you could see out over the whole of the Tyne Valley. You could see Northumbria, County Durham, you could see Newcastle, you could see Gateshead. It was an amazing view, amazing view. And often I'd find myself being quite claustrophobic, cycling to and from Durham and Gateshead, or on a bus to and from Durham and Gateshead. You know, it's always raining, it's always cold up there. And, and, and I'd be kind of like, oh, why am I even here? What am I doing with my life? But every morning, I'd wake up, I'd sit on the sofa by our window, and I'd look out of, of our window, and I'd remember, oh yeah, we moved here because we thought it might make a difference to plant a church here. I'd remember why we did the things why we were doing all the stuff that we were doing, why I was cycling in the wind and rain every day. I'd remember it. What it did was the act of looking up. It gave me perspective every morning. And that perspective, actually, it gave me faith. It gave me faith. I remembered why. And when we pray, we do a similar thing. We look up to God, who's the only one who can give us the big picture on our lives. When we pray, the Spirit gives us wisdom and understanding on how to live. God wants to give you perspective on your situation. The, the Greek word for fill here, it literally means to complete. God wants to give you complete knowledge. And this isn't that secret insider knowledge that we talked about earlier. This is real, practical, earthy knowledge to see God's perspective on any scenario that you find yourself in and to know how to live in that scenario. But it's not just to live in it, it's to bear fruit in it. That means to have an impact, to make a difference. Prayer is the secret weapon to understanding the perspective, you, to understanding and getting a perspective on the situation where you find yourself. 
and how to make a difference to other people. And what happens when you pray is you start to realize that no matter where you are on this little diagram, if you feel like you're in, but you need to get in a bit more, or if you feel like you're out here, or maybe if you feel like you're down here, miles away, totally excluded, or floating in and out, in in and out, what prayer does is it makes you look up and you see that really wherever you are on here, it doesn't really matter, even if you're right in the middle or right on the edge. To have a relationship with Jesus Christ is the most important thing, not to be in the in crowd or out excluded. To have a relationship with Jesus is the thing that you really need. And this faith in Jesus, this perspective that we get of God's will that we can get through prayer isn't just pie in the sky, a nice feeling. It's earthy, it's practical. It has real world applications. Verse 10 and 12 say this, so that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and please him in every good way. Biblical knowledge is not just possession of facts. It's not just about knowing lots. You don't have to know Greek to be a good Christian. Wisdom in the Bible is practical. And today, God wants to fill you with the knowledge to live whatever your circumstances. Whatever situation you find yourself in, God wants to help you live right there, right now. So look up, get some perspective. He's with you. He's with us. And he can walk you through it. And, and don't do it alone. We, Emily mentioned about groups earlier in the service. Last week, we launched groups. And groups are such an important way to learn God's will for your life. The growth engine for fulfillment in your life should be Christian community with Jesus Christ at the center. God uses other Christians to shape you, to mold you. He wants you to work it out in community. And if you're not in a group, can I encourage you to join a group? We've got loads of different groups. If you're struggling to look up in faith in your situation, Surround yourself with others who could do it for you. The third and the final way to find fulfillment is to look out with hope. Verse 12 says this. Giving joyful thanks to the Father who's qualified you to share in the inheritance of his holy people, the kingdom of light. Once your perspective has changed and you can see that you have a God and a Father, as the passage says, who qualifies you to be in his kingdom. Verse 13 says that he's rescued you from the dominion of darkness. He's brought you into the Son. That is Jesus, the one who forgives your sins. That's our hope. Then you're actually in a position to look out, to look out. And you might see that other people might need this hope too. Other people could do with hearing it. I was out yesterday walking home along the North Coat Road with my family. And everyone was out eating, drinking, looking like they were having a lot of fun. And I, I just, a thought popped into my head. I thought, I wonder how many people out here today, or maybe out there today, I wonder to how many of them does our church, St. Mark's up on the hill, bear a complete irrelevance? And that got me thinking, oh, that's sad. Because actually, in our church, today, right now, our, this group of people sat here, we hold the key to a fulfilled life. We hold the key to a changed world. The keys to the kingdom of light have been given to us. We, sh- we know it. We've got it. We've got the answer And so the question I found myself asking after that was, well, if in our church, St. Mark's, we know that the answer is Jesus Christ, is a relationship with Jesus Christ, then to how many people on this road does Jesus Christ bear a complete irrelevance? And you might want to ask yourself that, and I ask myself that all the time, about maybe your work situation 
or at school? How many people here does Jesus Christ bear a complete irrelevance? And so when we start to realize all of this, we start to realize that maybe these rings don't exist to be broken into, but to be broken out of. You see, God rarely sends lost souls into a church. He does occasionally, but not that often. But every week, every day even, he sends redeemed souls out into the world. And our job then, wherever you find yourself, if you're here, if you're right in the middle, our job is to break out and is to find people on the edge and is to bring them back in to the center, wherever you find yourself. If you feel excluded, your job is to go out and find people and bring them in. If you feel like you're in the middle, your job is to go out and find people and bring them in. So how do we do that? I've got a friend called Timothy. I met Timothy five years ago. He's from Chennai in southern India. Uh, he's a, he was a migrant worker. But because and because he was a migrant, he'd learned five or six different languages. He'd learned Hindi, Tamil, he spoke English, he spoke, he spoke quite a few other languages. And one day, Timothy went out and he got absolutely battered. He, was, he drank loads, absolutely loads, so much that he passed out in a ditch by the side of the road. And it was as if he was dead. People passed him by and thought that he was dead. But a Christian walked by and saw him and thought, he's not dead. I'm going to take him in. So he picked him up, carried him into his house, gave him a bed for the night, he gave him a bath, he sobered him up, he gave him some food, some money to get back to where he lived, where his job was. And Timothy asked this man, what, when he was kind of sober enough, he said, what, why did you do it? Why did you do this? And the man answered, oh, I did this because I'm a Christian because I feel like this is what Jesus would have done. On the spot, Pastor Timothy, Timothy gave his life to Jesus. And he went back to his work, and he inevitably got thinking, what could I do with my faith? Someone, someone told me, so maybe I should tell other people. Maybe I should go and get other people. And he came across something called the Alpha Course, which is something that we run here at St. Mark's. Alpha is a series of interactive sessions based around the Christian faith. It's loads of questions about life, the universe, and, and faith. And Timothy, he learned the Alpha sessions. He learned all 11 of them off by heart. While he was driving around on his moped, he'd listen to the sessions, and, he, and he'd learn them off by heart. And then wherever he was working, he'd turn up, and he'd, he'd find the people in the, cafeteria, in the cafeteria at lunchtime, and he'd say what language do you speak? What language do you speak? And, and they'd say, oh, Tamil. And he'd go, great. Would you like to do the Alpha course? And they kind of looked around and went, oh, there's nothing better to do. Okay. So he'd, he'd do the Alpha course. When I met Timothy five years ago, he'd accidentally planted three churches, each with about 75 people in. And he's now a pastor of those churches. And he, he's planting more and more. He is an example of someone not chasing the in crowd or looking out for this secret knowledge or anything like that, but he, of going out and getting people and bringing them in. He was living a fulfilled life. And the question for us today is, are we willing to go? Are you willing to go to your colleagues, to your friends? Are we willing to go to the homeless? Are we willing to break out of these rings because if we do it might put us in some uncomfortable situations the bible uses the phrase if you want to find your life first you need to lose it jesus says lose it for my sake before you find it and you know gulp take a deep breath this might pinch a little bit it might feel uncomfortable but it will fulfill you so the question is are we willing to do that, do we want to watch more Netflix and stay comfortable, or do we want to go? Because if we want fulfilled lives, Jesus is saying to us to go.